Okay, class, we're back at it again. Uh, this uh, video and lecture will be on resource utilization analysis, as I trust you can see on the screen. Okay, so fuel selection will be the first topic. Okay, fuel selection can provide significant reductions in operating costs due to differences. Uh, some fuels just cheaper than others. <clears throat> um, sometimes energy cost and maintenance expenditures are offsetting. Uh, some fuels are cheap because they're hard to burn <clears throat> and they require a lot of maintenance, clean out, uh, deterioration of the equipment more so than say something like natural gas, which is a pretty easy fuel to combust. Uh, interruptible fuel pricing can provide great economic benefits. What that is, is for example, if I sign up for interruptible natural gas <clears throat> on my boiler, I get a between <laughs> probably a 10 to 20% discount in the fuel price. But what I give up is if it gets really cold and the uh, demand for natural gas goes really high, the utility can call me and within typically an hour, <clears throat> on a boiler fuel, you have to uh, quit using that fuel on, by whatever amount that you have deemed to be interruptible. And so you either have to shut down or you can have a dual fuel boiler. You could switch from natural gas to diesel or some other fuel, propane. Uh, and for that uh, flexibility in your operation, you get to save money on the purchase of natural gas. So it's up to the company to look at that and decide. Uh, some companies can be flexible. Maybe a short interruption in steam supply would not be uh, a problem. Others just cannot tolerate that. And so the interruptible fuel is not an option for them. <coughs> uh, there are environmental issues that can be significant uh, associated with fuel selection. You know, everybody knows all the uh, hubbub and hullabaloo about burning coal these days, uh, sulfur emissions, uh, NOx, nitric oxides, all that sort of thing, particulates and even CO2 uh, are of concern. Uh, CO2 is not regulated currently, but the rest are. Uh, fuel efficiency uh, will generally be an influencing factor when changing fuel. Your boiler efficiency is going to be different uh, based on what fuel you combust. And you may have to have a different type of boiler to burn <clears throat> a solid fuel, uh, say uh, wood waste or green wood waste. So you can't just put that in a natural gas boiler. So you have to have the right equipment mix. Uh, here's a little example. Uh, this is our example boiler and it is equipped with a feed water economizer. And we've got uh, three different fuel options. Uh, our steam generating conditions are the same, uh, 400 PSIG and 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, on the left, we see we have green wood, which is a very cheap fuel, $2 a million BTUs. Again, it, it, green wood has a very high moisture content, probably between 45 and 50% on average. Uh, boiler capacity is the same as we've been looking at across the board, 120,000 pounds an hour. In this case, we're looking at steam production at 80,000 pounds an hour. Flue gas exit temperature at 400, uh, and uh, flue gas oxygen at 5%, and an efficiency on the order <clears throat> of 71.3%. So we see that the fuel is cheap, but the efficiency is low, and so that's a factor you have to consider. Uh, natural gas is our, uh, the fuel we've been considering, and we see we're keeping it at $10 a million BTUs, which again is high by today's standards. Same boiler, uh, steam production here is 100,000 pounds an hour, that's what we've been doing. Uh, flue gas temperature with the economizer dropped to 300 degrees Fahrenheit, and we tuned the boiler and got down to 5% oxygen, and that gave us uh, an efficiency of about 84.2%. Uh, moving on uh, to the right, we see number six, uh, oil, 
which is a very heavy, thick, viscous oil, and that's a high sulfur value. So perhaps we would have to have some uh, sulfur dioxide cleanup equipment in order to be able to uh, burn this high sulfur uh, number six oil. Fuel costs $5 a million BTUs, half of that of natural gas. Um, Sam Boiler, we're looking at 80,000 pounds of steam an hour. Flue gas temperature here would be expected to be about 350. Oxygen 5%, efficiency 87.4%. Remember, there's not much hydrogen uh, in this high sulfur oil compared to natural gas. And of course, the green wood efficiency is low because of all the moisture. So <clears throat> those are our three uh, different boilers we're considering. And let's look at uh, fuel selection calculation. <clears throat> See if I can move this just a little bit there, get that out of the way. Um, okay, there's an, e an economic incentive associated with increasing steam production from the oil boiler uh, as compared to the natural gas boiler. And we'll see some little equations here that would allow us to uh, quantify that. So we've got a little derivation going on here. But so the savings, is the cost of the uh, first fuel, which would be the natural gas, minus the cost of the second fuel, which would be the uh, fuel oil, times the number of hours per year that, that this goes on, that's the tau. <clears throat> so we're gonna substitute uh, for these uh, capital Ks here. So this is the uh, uh, steam production, uh, the cost of the fuel divided by the efficiency of the boiler, for fuel one, for fuel two, a little bit of factoring going on, and we finally get the expression that we're looking for down here, the savings. Uh, <coughs> we would select some particular mass flow that we're interested in switching. This would be the enthalpy of the steam, minus enthalpy of the feed water, and this is the fuel cost per million BTUs divided by the efficiency on fuel one minus the fuel cost dollars per million BTUs on fuel two, divided by that efficiency, and all this multiplied by the number of hours per year that this is gonna go on, this uh, uh, changing this amount of steam from one fuel to the other. So just for simplicity, we've selected a uh, 1,000 pounds an hour as the amount of steam. Uh, this is the enthalpy of my steam minus feed water. This is the natural gas cost, $10 a million, divided by that boiler efficiency. And we're going to subtract off the $5 a million for the high sulfur uh, number six oil, divided by its boiler efficiency times the number of <coughs> um, hours per year. And this comes up $62,000 per year for every thousand pounds that we can switch from the natural gas boiler to the uh, uh, number six fuel oil boiler. So that could be compelling. I mean, a thousand pounds is not very much. So if we could switch, you know, 40, 50, 60,000 pounds, it'd be a significant uh, amount of money saved. Okay, so let's uh, keep moving forward here. Uh, modification should be investigated to, uh, to increase steam production from the wood boiler because the wood boiler is the one with the cheapest fuel. Um, and so we're gonna look at that. Uh, so the uh, Greenwood boiler, this is just parroting back information we've already had up there. So I'm gonna move forward here. Okay, so we do the same type of calculation. Uh, we're just gonna switch from natural gas to uh, wood, the green wood. And so it's the same thousand pounds an hour, the same enthalpy differences, cost of natural gas divided by its boiler efficiency minus the cost of wood divided by its boiler efficiency times operating hours. And we get $91,000 per year per thousand pounds that we switch. So fuel switching can save us some money, pretty obviously. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> many issues limit fuel switching capabilities that you have to, to fight your way through all these things. This may not be as easy as it seems. 
environmental regulations. You may have a permit that you can't exceed for steam production or fuel uh, consumption of a particular fuel. Uh, fuel storage and handling issues. So you want to burn a bunch more green wood, but you know, that means you have to store more on site. You may not have a place for it and you may have a hard time uh, moving it into the boiler at a, at a higher feed rate. Uh, your boiler capabilities, maybe your boiler is not big enough to generate all the steam that you would like with the cheaper fuels. <coughs> um, moving on to the second major bullet point here, how should multi-fuel sites be operated and modeled? Okay, well, we have an, uh, a, a concept called the impact fuel cost should be utilized. And what is an impact fuel cost? Well, the impact fuel is a fuel that will change consumption if steam demand changes. So let's say that we did a project. Say maybe we're burning all three of these fuels. And let's say that we do something and we reduce our steam demand by a thousand pounds. Well, which boiler is going to back off? You know, probably one would be designated the swing boiler. And we would hope that it is the natural gas boiler in this case, because if we reduce that steam usage at, uh, by a thousand pounds an hour, that's the most costly fuel. That's going to save us the most money. If we reduce steam consumption by a thousand pounds an hour and it was the, uh, uh, the wood boiler that backed off, it would not save nearly as much because that fuel is not as expensive. So that's what I mean by impact. If we reduce, increase or decrease steam consumption, which, which fuel is going to see the change? Typically the highest cost fuel uh, in use is desired to be the impact fuel. I think I already said that and blended costs do not reflect actual uh, system changes. So you know, sometimes fuels get more expensive the more you use, sometimes they get cheaper the more you use. So, you know, the, the last bit of fuel that you bought is the first uh, fuel that you'll save if you reduce uh, your steam production. Likewise, if you increase it, it's probably going to be the cost of that last little bit of that fuel that you purchased uh, that you're going to buy a little bit more of and you would get that price. So, you know, to do this accurately, you need to give some thought to what the impact fuel is when you do a study. Okay, let's move on to steam demands. Steam demands uh, take on many different forms. Reducing steam consumption can often result in uh, the most significant energy reduction opportunities. Uh, we can eliminate inappropriate steam use or we can reduce appropriate steam use. And what we have here is a little example that uh, we can uh, talk from to kind of illustrate this concept. So what we've got here is we've got uh, a thousand, I'm sorry, 10,000 standard cubic feet per minute of air that has to be heated to 120 degrees for some process use. That's what it says here, the process. Outside air is currently being supplied to the process, which you know, say for a period of time, maybe a year, if it's a cold climate, but we're looking at 40 degrees outside that we're gonna to heat to 120. So what is that? That's an 80 degree increase in temperature. And we're gonna use 20 PSIG saturated steam in order to accomplish this heating. Okay, so just, you know, a pretty simple calculation. The amount of heat that we have to put in the air is uh, M dot CP delta T and CP delta T is delta H, the enthalpy difference. So that this shouldn't be any surprise to you. So M dot, that's the uh, 10,000 standard uh, cubic feet per minute. So that's a volume flow. We got to multiply it by density. In this case, this is a fairly standard density number, um, but it's I'm sure it's determined at 40 degrees, 0.074 pounds mass of air per standard cubic foot. So you multiply this together and that gives us M dot. Specific heat of air is 0.24 BTUs per pound mass per degree Fahrenheit or Rankine. Doesn't matter since it's a temperature difference. I've got uh, 210, I'm sorry, 220 minus 40 and then times at 60 minutes per hour. Because um, this, uh, this uh, rate is gonna be uh, 
pounds mass per minute. So we got to multiply by 60 because we want to get this in BTUs per hour. So it's 854,200 BTUs an hour. You know, not quite a million, but still, I mean, that's a that's a fair amount of energy. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey man, we can take that that air from inside. We'll pull it off the top of the plant or out of the warehouse or something like that, where it's much warmer, and we'll just circulate it. And you know, that's uh, that way we can reduce the amount of steam that we're using to heat this airflow. Okay, so the speculation is that instead of 40, we can uh, get this stuff into our heating unit at 65 of the same 120, same equation, comes out uh, 587,300 BTUs per hour. So we save the difference between the previous number and this. I don't have it on the slide. You can do the math. But the steam demand reduces to 70%, or that's a 30% reduction in steam uses. And so in this scenario, that saves uh, 250 pounds mass per hour, which is about 34,000 a year. So very simple concept. Let's heat up something warm instead of something colder and save some steam and some energy. Okay, let's move on to, to combine heat and power. Okay, so let's see what we got here. So combined heat and power, or CHP, is also known as cogeneration. And I've mentioned this in class, so I think you probably have a pretty good idea uh, what this is going to be about. But uh, these activities almost always include an aspect of power generation. So what we typically do is we'll burn fuel, get a fairly high temperature, high pressure steam, put it through a back pressure turbine, get some electricity, come out of that turbine, and use that thermal energy that comes out of the turbine in a process. And so we don't have to reject anything to the environment uh, or not very much. We still have heat losses and such, but uh, not like uh, just a standard power plant cycle, which is what we're looking at here. This is a standard Rankin cycle, fuel input, uh, high temperature, high pressure steam through a turbine, get it as low in, in pressure as we can to get as much out of this turbine to get as much uh, electric power generation, dump the rest to a condenser, where we take lake water or air or something and uh, blow it across this or through it, whatever, and reject a good bit of heat to the environment. Get this back in the liquid state and pump it back in the boiler. So I think y'all are pretty familiar with that. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, this 50 percent of electrical power produced in the U.S. is produced from standard power station burning coal. <clears throat> uh, that's an old statistic. We're probably I would say we're probably pushing around 35% now. It's dropped significantly uh, since the reduction in price of natural gas and uh, renewables are coming on. They used to not be very much of a player, but they're becoming uh, more and more important every year as more and more solar and wind projects uh, get constructed. Uh, this is some fairly old data from 2009. <clears throat> this is uh, net electrical generation in all sectors. And this happens to be 2009. Uh, we see, and this is billion kilowatt hours. So back in these days, you can see coal was, well, you can take these numbers. Here's the total over here. And you can do the division and calculate the percentages. But you can see coal's a big player. Petroleum's not natural gas was a significant player, and this has gone up and this has gone down since these stats, other gases you can read about. Nuclear uh, is fairly stable. It's probably gone up a little bit, but, but I mean, there's been a, a few stations decommissioned. Uh, TVA is brought on watch bar too, and the TVA is brought on both watch bar units, and they're talking about, I think, maybe Belfont coming on in the future. Uh, pump storage, uh, it's like uh, Raccoon Mountain. We pump it up to the top uh, with cheap power at night and let it fall back down. <clears throat> That's a uh, lake up on top of the mountain, let it fall back down through the turbines during the daytime when the price of uh, electricity is high. It's a negative because we don't get as much power out as we have to expend to get it up there, but financially it works. There's conventional hydropower, uh, wood, wood waste, geothermal, solar PV, again, this number's increased significantly since then. There's wind, 
So all of this is under the heading of renewable and other, I don't remember, you can read the, the notes down here. So there's our total, a little bit short of 4,000 billion kilowatt hours. That's a lot of energy. <clears throat> okay, so looking at the simple utility power station, the question is, what would the individual uh, component efficiencies be? And we look at it, <clears throat> boiler, big utility boilers are pushing 90%. Uh, especially burning coal, uh, fuel oil, natural gas would be a little bit less because of the hydrogen losses. Uh, the, these big uh, utility turbines, isentropic efficiency, 85% or so, generator efficiency, 99%. So what would be the overall fuel to power conversion efficiency? What do you think? Think about it a minute. Well, there's... <clears throat> Uh, overall efficiency about 35%. Uh, Supercritical cycles can get up and combined cycles are now pushing the low 50s. But still, <clears throat> if you're looking at just a simple cycle like this, probably 35% on a good day, might even not be that high. And so the efficiency is the electrical workout divided by the energy and the fuel in. Right. Why is it so low? Because 50% of the fuel energy is lost from the system in the condenser. 50%. Wow. That's significant. So we lose roughly 10% in the boiler, most of that stack loss. So we put in fuel here, we lose 10% there. We lose 50% there, a few other miscellaneous losses. We're at 35. You know, significant. Okay, industrial power station. Let's look at what those typical component efficiencies would be. Boiler, 85%. Smaller boiler, not as sophisticated. Doesn't have all the heat recovery stuff that the uh, uh, utility boiler does. Uh, turbine, isentropic efficiency, 70%. Again, it's smaller, probably has uh, not as high pressure. Uh, the condenser pressure may not be as low, 70%. Generator, 95%. So what would be the, uh, what would be the overall energy conversion efficiency? It can approach 70% because thermal in, uh, industries, industrial facilities have a need for thermal energy. So what happens is so a lot, or maybe sometimes almost all of this heat that in the power station gets rejected to the environment can be used uh, by the industry and that drastically improves the efficiency. So we uh, have a turbine here that takes out some energy, gives us electricity, and then we come out of here and we can, you can use the vast majority of this. And so, this combination, even though the boiler and the turbine are not as efficient, because we throw we can throw away much, much less, we can get efficiencies easily in the 60 or low 70 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, utility uh, stations incorporating district heating uses of thermal energy operate with excellent efficiency. So some utilities will actually come out of this uh, turbine at a higher pressure so that we get enough temperature for this to be useful and distribute it out to the community to provide space heat for homes during the, during the winter and the heating season. Europeans, Russians do a lot of that stuff. Not so much in the States. Okay, let's look at some steam turbine fundamentals. Uh, steam turbines are devices used to convert uh, thermal uh, steam energy into shaft energy. So this is a little bit of a cartoon here. Uh, high pressure steam. Uh, this is the governor that uh, controls the speed. Um, so we've got inlet valves that allow the steam into the turbine. They would go through, this would be a stationary blade row, rotating, stationary, rotating, stationary, all the way down through the thing. So this would be a one, two, three, four, five, six stage turbine. 
All, as we flow through this thing, these blades are cocked at an angle, uh, causes a torque on the shaft, which makes it spin, and we can take power out. So we have low pressure steam maximum. That's kind of what the steam turbine is all about. Uh, there are different types of steam turbines. Uh, a topping turbine takes the high pressure steam. Uh, it's also a back pressure type turbine. And by back pressure, it means that we come out at a high enough pressure that that pressure is still useful for other purposes. An extraction turbine, um, you put in high pressure steam and you can uh, extract steam at different pressures at different locations, kind of on the side of the turbine as the steam passes through it. And then we finally get to the end of the turbine, which has the lowest pressure steam. So you can produce three or four different pressures of steam from one extraction turbine. Uh, a straight condensing turbine, uh, high pressure steam in, the lowest pressure steam out possible, and then condense the steam. That's what the typical utility company does. Extraction condensing turbine, we can have extractions through the turbine before we get to the lowest pressure and then uh, condense and multiple extraction. I already kind of talked about that. That's just multiple extracting steam at multiple pressures as it expands down the length of the turbine. Uh, that's a picture of a turbine, gives some kind of an idea, steam inlet, steam expands in this direction. Um, <clears throat> we've got some seals here, we've got some seals here, rotating and stationary uh, blade rows, ceiling strips, inner casing, outer casing. Just let you kind of see what, what a big steam turbine looks like. That's a high pressure unit. Um, this shows how the steam flows through. The nozzles are considered uh, stationary, and the uh, the buckets uh, blade uh, are on the rotating side. So this would be held by the casing. This would be held by the rotor. And of course, the, these nozzles set up the steam flow so that they go across these turbine blades and cause the shaft to rotate. And then so we go stationary rotating, stationary rotating as we move away. Actually down the length of the turbine, uh, blade, sh blade shrouds are sometimes uh, kind of uh, riveted on the end of these blades uh, in order to do vibration tuning and provide uh, structural support. This shows what the steam looks like. As it moves through, this would be uh, an opposed flow rotor. This is uh, we're showing uh, steam condensation regions. So this would be the low pressure rotor, most likely. So the steam comes in, the higher pressure, and as it expands, the pressure drops. When we get to this dashed line, we start getting uh, two phase, we get droplets condensing. And so these last couple of blade rows operate wet, <clears throat> which can cause stress corrosion and uh, erosion damage and all. So uh, it's a much more aggressive environment uh, at the, these last couple of blade rows at the exit. The steam comes in, goes each direction to kind of balance the uh, axial thrust on the turbine shaft. <clears throat> a picture of some actual turbine blades at a TVA uh, plant. Uh, you can see we've got some blade erosion in here. You can see where some of the trailing edges have been eroded away by particulates that uh, sometimes get in the steam flow. Uh, so this is the body of the rotor, some ceiling uh, uh, strips here. The casing comes down and uh, has uh, little seals that come down and almost touch these things to keep steam from leaking. Actually, you want all the steam to go through the blades. Uh, <clears throat> more of the same, this would be the labyrinth seals I mentioned there. So all of these, uh, the, the rotor has these little uh, teeth kind of machine in it go all the way around and then the stationary portion of the uh, uh, casing sets down on top of this and there are very small clearances here uh, maybe two three four mils and it just makes it hard for steam to leak through this very torturous path it has some different geometries of these labyrinth seals that we show here uh, looking at the big utility so this would be the high pressure steam Intermediate pressure steam. This would be probably went uh, steam went back to the boiler to be reheated, came through here, and then passes over in the middle. And these are the two uh, LP sections. 
Some steam would go this way and some would come back up this way. These largest blades are the final ones that the steam would exit before going to the condenser. Uh, back pressure steam turbines, uh, I think we mentioned that. Uh, discharge steam at a pressure greater than atmospheric, and that's typically useful for some other uh, application. So we can have, for small ones, we have one stage, and for larger pressure drops, larger turbines, we can have multiple stages. That's just a picture of a small back pressure turbine. You can look at that. <clears throat> uh, that's another kind of a cutaway version. Small back pressure turbine. Extraction turbines, <clears throat> extraction steam turbines have more than one discharge port. So for example, we're putting the main steam in here, the expanse here, in this case it's showing one stage, <clears throat> and then we have an exit uh, out the side of the turbine. Uh, so we drop some pressure across this, but there's still some you know, significant pressure left in the steam. We take it out to some use, could be process use, could be feed water heater, whatever. And then we expand through three more stages before we come out um, down here. So the fact that we have this extra uh, port where steam can exit at a higher pressure, that's called the extraction of the extraction turbine. Uh, that's just a picture, kind of shows you one way that some of these things can, can get built. Uh, condensing turbines, this is what the utility typically does. Uh, so condensing tur turbines discharge steam at pressures less than atmospheric. Steam must con uh, be condensed uh, to pump it back to the boiler. Exiting steam quality is typically much greater than 90% by mass. And so it's still mostly vapor. There's some moisture in it here but we have a lot of vapor. And if you have vapor, you have energy. It may be low temperature energy, but we, and that's what's happened. We've pulled the pressure so low that this temperature is so low that it's really not useful for anything. And so we wind up just throwing that heat away. Okay. This shows kind of a cutaway of what a good size uh, condensing turbine can look like. It's a pretty big guy. Okay, let's look at the first law of thermo. I know you all love it dearly, <clears throat> as I do. So this would be steady state, steady flow. So, and we're gonna apply this to the turbine. And so uh, this is any heat loss from the turbine surface to the environment, minus any work produced by the turbine coming out of the shaft work. And so then we have the plus the summation on the inlets. We Typically, you only have one inlet to the steam turbine, but you know the general statement of the first law allows multiple. So we say it's the summation of the inlets of the mass flow times the enthalpy n uh, v squared over two. Uh, that's the kinetic energy, and this is the elevation energy minus summation of the exits so of the mass flow rate out times those same terms. <clears throat> so if we ignore heat loss from the turbine because Compared to the amount of energy going through it, there's not much really gets lost from the surface. And we typically throw away kinetic and potential energy terms, and all this big equation uh, collapses to this, which is looking, looking better. <clears throat> okay, And so uh, it turns out to be a pretty simple relationship. So we see that the thermal energy removed from the steam is converted into shaft power. So that's the enthalpy in, enthalpy out, mass flow rate of steam equals the shaft work. Um, and of course, this is for a simple turbine, one inlet, one exit. If you had an extraction turbine, then you would have multiple exits that you would have to consider. And the amount of steam that would exit each one of those would have to be taken into consideration as well. So it can get more complicated. <clears throat> An energy balance conducted on a steam turbine will review a, an uh, exceptionally high efficiency. Essentially, all of the energy taken out of the steam is converted into shaft energy. High quality uh, energy streams are exported from the turbine. Okay. So what that's saying is we still have a lot of energy in the steam exiting a turbine. 
Okay. Question is, what are we going to do with it? So um, let's take a look. Here's the first law efficiency, which is the shaft work divided by the mass flow at a times the difference in enthalpy. And so this is not really of great interest to calculate because it always comes up very, very close to 100. And so, you know, if you already know the answer, what's the point in calculating it? So this, this the first law efficiency on steam turbines is not very useful. Uh, steam turbines operate with only minor losses. There's a small amount of buried friction, heat transfer, gland, where a little steam leaks along those labyrinth seals. But it's, uh, unless something's wrong, it's a powerfully small amount. Okay, so for the... Uh, uh, efficiency of a steam turbine, we turn to the second law of thermodynamics. And so this defines, and we, we think about a perfect turbine, which is one that would have no entropy generation. And so this defines a maximum amount of shaft power that could possibly uh, be produced based on the laws of physics. And so this perfect turbine operates isentropically, i.e. constant entropy, as I mentioned. Okay, so this is a second law efficiency or uh, an isentropic efficiency. Whoops, uh, I gotta go back, clicking around over there. Um, okay, so really it's, the, it's a comparison of the actual work produced from a real turbine to the work produced from a perfect or isentropic turbine, okay? And so there's the definition. Actual work, real turbine, isentropic work, ideal turbine. So there's the, the symbols. I don't wanna keep doing that. Okay, so uh, isentropic efficiency. So this is the mass flow rate of steam times the inlet enthalpy, which is gonna be the same in both cases minus the actual exit enthalpy, okay? And in the denominator here on the isentropic work, <clears throat> it's the exit enthalpy at a constant entropy. And so what you're going to see, and of course we're going to say, we're going to do it for the steam, steam flow, so that's going to cancel. So this is really our expression. And notice uh, HE actual and HE isentropic are at the same exit pressure. So we have the same inlet condition, the same exit pressure. The only difference is this one in the denominator occurs at constant entropy. And for this one, there's irreversibilities involved and the entropy increases. So you don't get as much work out of the actual as you do the isentropic. Uh, <clears throat> this is our old... Uh, temperature entropy diagram. And so we've talked about this before. Saturated liquid up to the critical point, saturated vapor, two phase in the dome, critical point. And these are isobars at different pressures, increasing pressures as we go up in the dome. <coughs> uh, we see liquid and vapor, this kind of hatched over here is inside the dome. Vapor over here, superheated or saturated on the boundary and liquid subcooled or compressed up in here. Y'all know all that. Okay, and so uh, basic ideal uh, Rankin cycle power plant. Uh, we see this shows the components. I think you've seen that. I think y'all are familiar with this boiler, turbine, condenser, pump. And so uh, let's see where you wanna start. Here's the pump into the pump at three, saturated liquid, compressed liquid at four. That's ideal because it's straight up on the entropy scale. Then we go in the boiler, and so we have to heat uh, this uh, subcooled liquid up to saturation. And then over to here, if we stop at saturated vapor, if we superheat, we come up here. And then we drop through the turbine. Uh, we're superheated, we drop through in this fashion. If we took saturated, we would drop through over here. Note the amount of moisture. Uh, there's a whole boatload of moisture here, not so much here. And then we have to condense in the condenser. I think you all remember that. I hope so. So this shows, uh, compare the ideal to real turbine. So 
uh, let's say, so here's our inlet condition at three megapascals, and uh, I guess that's 400 degrees C. And so the isentropic turbine goes straight down at constant entropy until it gets to the low exit pressure, which is 50 kPa. And so this actually drops into the dome in this example. And the actual one comes over because we have entropy generation, it winds up out here. And so this is still superheated. So there's a whole bunch more energy in H2 compared to H2A. So this kind of shows what the isentropic efficiency, how it looks on the TS diagram. Okay, so the steam turbine efficiency is not like a boiler efficiency. Uh, you said that the isentropic efficiency is a comparison of an actual turbine uh, operation to that of a perfect turbine operating with the same inlet conditions and outlet pressure. Uh, the steam exiting the turbine contains significant amounts of useful energy. And we, we have to always keep that in mind. We have to always try to utilize that energy to up the overall cycle efficiency. Uh, this shows the equation <clears throat> and real small um, back pressure turbines without with small steam flows and not great pressure drop can have very low isentropic efficiencies. And the big guys at the power station uh, can get up to 85%. So really to know, you need to contact a manufacturer, give them your conditions, steam flow, temperature in, pressure in, pressure out, and they can uh, tell you very, very closely what the efficiency of, a, of their steam turbine would be under those conditions. Okay, major contributors, whoops. There we go, major contributors to isentropic efficiency, turbine design, control valve type, and turbine load. We talk a lot about control valve type in the steam power plants class. Generally, single stage uh, turbines operate with lower isentropic efficiency. So, and generally the smaller ones with the lower pressure drops tend to be one, two stages. The bigger ones, larger steam flows and bigger pressure drops tend to be multiple stages. So you get better efficiencies out of them. Uh, back pressure turbine performance. Okay, and so built into this is the assumption that the, the energy in the steam that comes out of this turbine we're going to utilize. Okay, and so that makes a difference. That assumption is, is behind these numbers. And so we see based on fuel cost and boiler efficiency what the uh, cost of generating uh, a megawatt hour would be in terms of dollars. So if we have $2 a million fuel, 80% boiler efficiency, that's $8.50 per megawatt hour. And so divide by three, so that's $0.0085 per kilowatt hour, 0.08. So that's less than a penny. So wow, if we got cheap fuel and this and we can do this, we can get power for virtually nothing. Now, as the fuel cost goes up, we're assuming that the boiler efficiency stay the same. And you can see what the impact cost or the cost of generating uh, this electricity per megawatt hour is. And so, you know, even at $18 a million, if we, if we uh, divide this by 1,001, two, so it's 0.076, that's about 7.7 .7 cents per kilowatt hour. That's still not awful. So you see this, these back pressure turbine economics, so long as we utilize the steam and the energy in the steam exiting the back pressure turbine, we get some pretty compelling uh, electrical cost. And that's the power of cogeneration. Okay, so this is our basic back pressure turbine diagram. Uh, so that's pretty much, I don't think I've got much to say. <laughs> okay, primary factors, uh, impact electrical cost, impact fuel cost, boiler efficiency, steam turbine efficiency, and steam demand. Okay, impact cost <clears throat> is the actual 
uh, economic impact of increasing or decreasing electrical consumption. So this would be the electric impact cost. Uh, the average cost of electricity is typically not the appropriate uh, analysis value. It's got to be that last one you buy or the first one you save. What is, what's the value of that to you? A thorough understanding of the electric rate structure is essential to evaluate the true impact. Uh, power generation systems. And so you've seen uh, something to do with some of these rate structures and you see how complex and complicated they can be. Okay, steam turbine example. Okay, so let's look at a turbine PRV as pressure reducing valve evaluation. So assume the site has a turbine generator set operating with an isentropic efficiency of 32% which is not just great. Determine the economic incentive associated with operating the turbine generator. Compared to passing steam through a pressure reducing valve, PRV, to satisfy the thermal demand. So, you know, we need low pressure steam. We generate high pressure steam. So how are we gonna drop pressure? We can do it through a turbine and get some useful power out, or we can do it uh, through a pressure reducing valve which just, which just reduces pressure. We don't get a useful product out of a PRV. <coughs> okay, uh, let's look at our example here. We got our same uh, steam generating conditions, steam fuel cost, boiler efficiency 84, operates all the time. Uh, saturated liquid condensate is discharged from the load at zero PSIG. That's, this is the load right here. Uh, so our purchase electricity is $70 a megawatt hour. Uh, turbine isentropic efficiency, 32%. And thermal, thermal demand is nominally 30,000 pounds an hour of 20 PSIG saturated steam, which is 35.5 billion BTUs an hour. And again, coming out here, we've got saturated liquid condensate discharged at zero PSIG. Okay, so this would be what it looks like uh, with the turbine. And this is what it would look like with a PRV. We still have the same thermal demand over here, but now instead of generating electricity, we simply drop this through a PRV. And note the PRV discharge temperature is, five, is 659 because we have constant enthalpy across this. And this could be a problem in trying to condense this steam. We have to cool it off some. We might actually spray in the valve in order to reduce that. Uh, but that could be an issue. Okay, side-by-side -side comparison. Um, so what do we got here? So this is our boiler. This is all this is. So we come into the turbine. Now, see, when we come out of the steam turbine, it's 505 in comparison with this is going to be 659. Okay, so, uh, we, but we get power production here and then this can satisfy this thermal demand uh, for 20 PSIG steam. Purchase electricity, 70 bucks a megawatt hour. Okay, so we simulate this in SSAT and this just shows uh, how we're modifying the system. So we're going to install uh, this uh, steam turbine. This is a uh, high pressure, low pressure turbine that was not there in the base case. There's our 32% and we're going to say it's 32,000 pounds an hour as the steam flow through it. Okay. And so this is the initial condition. So we're doing PRV over here. And so this is a fairly big system. We have some other turbines, but this is the HPLP and see it is not active in this model. Uh, we're about 260.9 thousand pounds an hour. We've got 90 thousand pounds an hour going through this PRV, uh, and we got 49 thousand going through this PRV. So that's kind of what we were doing before we do the project. Now this is what we happens after the project. <clears throat> so this is the turbine we turn on. So we're going to get. Uh, 701 kW of additional generation out of this. Um, and so our steam production goes up a little bit. 
because we have to make a little more because we took some energy out here and that has to be made up in the system. So we dropped 30,000 pounds an hour from this PRV and what was this previous one it was 49 and now it's down to a little short of uh, 19. So that's what the system looks like with the additional turbine, the additional code gen going on. And so what's that uh, tell us? Well, it's going to save us $132,000. So here's the, the power, uh, electrical power purchase will decrease because I'm generating more power. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so I pick up overall. Um, I pick up uh, 642 kW, uh, which I don't have to, that's the reduction in import power, which means I have to generate. So I was generating 7510 and now I'm generating uh, 8152. So that saves me 393,000 on my electric bill, but I have to generate more steam. That cost me 258,000 and I save 3,000 on water. So I net out 132,000. Still, you know, depending on the cost of that turbine, it, it could be a good project. Okay, back pressure turbine economics. Most industrial systems require uh, thermal energy, uh, not a particular mass flow, but a certain amount of heat to accomplish uh, some process need. <clears throat> the turbine will extract energy from the steam and convert it into shaft energy. And that we can, you know, we can turn a piece of equipment or we can turn a generator with that. The result will be an increased mass flow of steam required to satisfy the thermal demand. And so that's what we saw back up here. We were uh, uh, 260,900 and here we're 263,000. So we picked up additional steam generation because we installed that turbine. Uh, another, the, we can, play what if game. So we can, the same example is executed with a 70% isentropic efficient turbine. Wow. So this turbine can take out more energy from the steam. So we're going to get more <coughs> power gen out of this thing. This was 701. Now it's up to 1533. That's a significant boost in power. Yeah. So now uh, we're generating, <clears throat> compared to the, the first base case, uh, 1479 additional kW. So the power cost goes down 907,000. Fuel cost goes up uh, 591,000. Water cost goes up 8,000. So I net out uh, 309,000. So that's pretty nice. Now, you know, what's is gonna be the isentropic efficiency on that turbine? you're going to buy the one with the highest one that is reasonably priced. So it just depends on what the, what the manufacturers of the steam turbines tell you is the, the best performance they've got given your steam conditions. Uh, okay. So we've, we've run some other options here <coughs> for the original example. If the fuel price has increased from $10 a million, which is high to $15 a million, Oh my gosh, look, I mean, we basically just break even. So, you know, we, we save $2,000 a year. So you would obviously not do that. So this is kind of a play a little bit. The payback is a play between the cost of electricity and the cost of fuel. So this works well if the electric cost is high, the fuel cost is low. And of course, now we're going to say, let's see, the original example at the electrical price. So electrical price goes from 70 bucks to 100 bucks a megawatt hour. Now, all of a sudden, instead of 132,000, I'm saving 300,000 because the uh, reduction in electrical expenditures is significant because the power cost is 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So I'll see how this stuff goes. Um, <clears throat> And here's one, the original example, if electrical price is decreased, so now electricity gets cheaper to four cents a kilowatt hour, all of a sudden I'm losing money because I got $10 gas, which is expensive, and I got cheap power. 
I don't want to do this. So again, it's the, the relationship between the cost of natural gas or whatever your boiler fuel is to the cost of electricity that makes this thing go. High electrical cost, low fuel cost, good for cogen. Okay, so this kind of summarizes <coughs> all those different options. Uh, you can see the different electrical costs, fuel costs, isotopic efficiencies used, power production, and the, the savings, the net savings of the system. So you can look those over. Okay, condensing steam turbines. Uh, condensing steam turbines discharge, uh, uh, the discharge steam pressure is less than atmospheric. I think we've said that. Steam must be condensed to pump it back to the boiler. And exiting steam quality is typically much greater than 90%, indicating most of it's vapor, which carries a bunch of energy. Prim primary factors influencing condensing turbine operation are uh, the purchase power cost, purchase fuel cost, turbine efficiency, boiler efficiency, and turbine discharge pressure. So those are the key parameters. Let's take a look at uh, uh, steam entering the condenser contains huge amounts of energy. So let's look at this. So I put uh, into a condensing turbine, let's say I put 100 units of thermal energy. Well, I run the steam through this turbine, I get 27 units of shaft energy, which I can turn into electricity. That leaves 73 units of thermal energy in the condenser to be thrown away. That's what's so bad about condensing turbines. So for this example, the turbine receives superheated steam, same conditions, isentropic efficiency of turbines 80%, and discharge pressure is 1.4 PSIA, so that's a fairly hard vacuum. And so we can see the um, impact cost of, the, of generating electricity, dollars per megawatt hour, based on the fuel cost, and the isentropic efficiency of the turbine. And you see this is dollars per megawatt hour. So my guys down here, this highest, this is, that's almost 18 cents a kilowatt hour. If you've got $12 fuel, even at 80% isentropic efficiency, if you're at a low efficiency, this is um, 33.4 uh, cents a kilowatt hour, at, whew, can't afford that. You can't afford to do that. So see, even at $2, uh, this is what, 5.6 cents a kilowatt hour. And so we can get this down to three cents. But so, I mean, if you compare this to the back pressure turbine, these numbers are way high. And it's because of all the energy we throw away in the condenser. That's the key. So condensing steam turbines, efficiency reductions can result from things that can go wrong, blade deposits, blade erosion, seal wear, wet steam, and throttling. Uh, efficiency improvements can result from replaced blades, improved seals, you know, the seals clearances open up, you gotta repair those. Uh, turbine replacement, eh, maybe, but that's an expensive proposition and increase load. If you can get more steam through it, then that'll help your economics. Uh, these are pictures from a, this is about a 30 megawatt uh, turbine at Jamalco in Jamaica, which was a, a bauxite refinery. It was an alcohol plant. And uh, they get silica deposits because they don't do a good job in their water treatment. And these silica deposits just eat up the performance of this turbine. This is going to drop 10, 12 megawatts. The electrical price was 26 cents a kilowatt hour. And they just have to take this about every 10 years. They got to take this thing off and take it apart, take it down for a month and come in and sandblast all this crap out of here. The silica is hard to remove. So this is a good example of what you don't want to do to your steam turbine. Um, Let's see, condenser pressure can be reduced. So if the lower the condenser pressure, the better this thing's gonna operate, the more power you're gonna get out. Uh, and so how can you help your uh, condenser pressure? Well, sometimes we get uh, air and nitrogen and other non-condensable gases down here. <coughs> These units have purge cycles 
to pull those things out. So you've got to make sure that purge is working because that ups the overall pressure back here, which reduces your power again. Uh, clean the condenser. These tubes can get fouled. So every year or so, they got to be rotted out. You got condenser water going through, lake water going through here, and you can get fish, mussels, you can get all kinds of crud in here. Potato chip wrappers from the, uh, they're supposed to screen them out, but sometimes they get through. Uh, supplying condenser with reduced water temperature. Yeah, well, that sounds good, but that's hard to do. Uh, you, how are you going to make the lake colder? You're going to make Watch Bar Lake colder so that Kingston can have a better plant efficiency? I don't think so. Uh, supplying the condenser with additional cooling water. Now, sometimes pumps can become degraded and you don't get an adequate supply. So then by repairing that pump, you can get more water flow through here that condenses more steam, you get a lower back pressure, and that helps your turbine. So that does make sense. Okay, and guys, that's it for this one. I know this one ran on a little bit, so I hope you enjoy it.